Welcome back. Motlow State Community College. This is Professor Emily Seal. Um, we're getting to the end of the book here, so I've kind of done something different this time. I know you've heard me talk a lot, and so I've uh, interspersed today with a wonderful set of short videos from Crash Course Theater, which is a P, uh, PBS resource, which I think is just fantastic, and hopefully you, you're enjoying those, and as a result you might see this lecture is a little bit shorter today because he's covering most of your testable material. I'm just sort of reinforcing and filling in some blanks. So we've already spoken about Commedia dell'arte, which is by far the most um, famous form of theater going on in Italy in the Renaissance. Remember it, it borrowed very heavily from the Roman. Um, one exciting thing that's happening in Italy is that women are allowed on stage. These families are often doing commedia together. Isabella um, there is, is leading a troupe um, of, I think it's Gelosi, he probably says it correctly, um, but these comedies are improvised, they are often body, they're leaning into stereotypes as he talks about. So really exciting stuff going on in Italy and very formative for a lot of the classic works that we have today. So the unities are terms that the um, that the Italian um, neoclassical era put on playwrights. Now you have to remember that this is the age of Louis the Fourteenth. This is the age of ballet. We're finding a lot of art forms in restraint, right? Ballet is not free form. There are prescribed movements, and you are expected to conform to that prescribed sense of beauty in order to create something beautiful. And um, in Italy, they have created they've rediscovered Aristotle's work and they have unity of time, unity of place, unity of action, and very narrow restraints of what they consider to be a good play. Um, they really didn't see good plays for a while after putting these restraints on playwrights, which is sort of um, ironic. And we touched on this early on when we talked about Aristotle and the way that he influenced um, all of these types of uh, theater. So they believed in verisimilitude, that uh, no more satyrs, no ghosts, no soliloquies, no looking people directly in the eye. Um, they really wanted playwrights to adhere to a five-act structure. So a lot of restraints going on in these Italian neoclassical ideals. So moving over to England, we have these public theaters, which the Globe Theater, Shakespeare's Theater, um, was considered one of these public theaters. Uh, the Globe was not unique. Right across the road, there was the Swan, right? Um, and he talks a lot about the the way that the theater is set up in the video, so I won't belabor it too much, except to say that it is a thrust. You can see the audience standing on the sides of the stage and in front of the stage, and uh, it is surprisingly sound absorbent. When I took the tour, I couldn't help but stand up there and say a little a few wonderful poetic words from the bard, um, but it's a very, the wood is very sound absorbent, and the stage is a thrust. One of the secrets, you know, people kind of wonder, why is there a golden age of, of Elizabethan theater? Why is there a golden age of ancient Grecian theater? And a big part of what people may miss is that it was well-funded, right? Ambitious, hardworking people are going to go where the money is. So if what's popular at the time, what's making money at the time is, you know, writing novels, then people are going to become novelists. If what is making money at the time is... Um, being a playwright or an actor, then the best playwrights and actors are going to show up, right? Adaptable people who are ambitious and want to make money will find it. And the courts started to patronize at this time the plays, right? We have these dark ages of, you know, non-professionals putting on theater, and the theater was okay, but when we start having fully funded theater, it begins to explode. So the acting companies at that time had, um, a sharing system, a shareholder system, and that is that you could, instead of just getting a regular salary, you would share in the profits. 
So that helps motivate. Once again, we have an incentive-based program where, you know, it's in Shakespeare's best interest to write a good play. It's in Burbage's interest to play his best Hamlet because that's going to bring in the crowds. It's going to make more money. The more money they make, the more money they get, right? Um, they also had hirelings, you know, those minor roles who just got a base salary. And then they had apprentice, which, as we've already discussed, there were no women on the Elizabethan stage. And so... They were often played by boys who were just apprenticing in the company and whose voices hadn't even changed yet, right? And uh, cannot imagine. Juliet has some of the most beautiful uh, words strung together in the entire English language, in my, in my opinion. And I can't just imagine some squeaky pipsqueak uh, reciting those. Breaks my heart. Um, if you've ever seen Shakespeare in Love, I recommend it. I think it's a great play. Um, it's obviously imagined. There's a, also a stage version of it now, which I haven't gotten out to see. I think it's a musical. But Spanish Golden Age, which was another video that I asked you to watch. Um, uh, in the Spanish Golden Age, we have a different relationship with the church than in England. In Spain, there's still lots of conversation about religion going on on stage. We have um, the Spanish Inquisition, unfortunately, where lots of people died. Uh, but, but religion is not as, um, there's not a lot of civil war happening like there was in, in England, right? In England, the Protestants and Catholics were fighting. But in Spain, it's really the Catholics are dominating. And so there's not as much contention and nervousness around um, religion being depicted on the stage. So Calderon, right, was a contemporary of Shakespeare. And um, he wrote this play that's depicted here as it was performed at uh, the University of Colorado at Boulder. And um, as he says in the video, there's this prince who is chained um, outside. His king father is trying to protect him. And um, we kind of hear in the video about all that kind of goes on between this king and prince. Um, but, and as he said, and also in the video, there are tons and tons of these documents, tons and tons of wonderful Spanish plays as they were performed nightly. And they were performed often in courtyards, so we still have open air in both Spain and in Italy and in England, although it does mention the closed court performances, the performances that happened in wealthy patrons' homes, which were invited only, right? Those were not open to the public, but um, King James, for example, in the Jacobean times is known to have a lot of plays in his court. Um, the theaters were dangerous places to be because we still had an element of plague. It wasn't as bad as it was in the Middle Ages, but there was a strong link between going to the theater and catching a disease. It's also worth mentioning when we're talking back ah, uh, in Elizabethan, these theaters were on the wrong sides of the track. They were where the prostitutes were, where these gambling dens were. They were um, considered a vice. Let's go get some entertainment um, and not something where people were learning life lessons necessarily, as opposed to in Spain, where a lot of the plays still had a heavy link to that morality. They still um, were almost mini sermons as opposed to the English way. Women were allowed on stage. Women also wrote in Spain. So <laughs> this is a picture of Tartuffe. It's a modernized version by the National Theater. Um, and you can see he's standing there in his underwear. Uh, Tartuffe is a play that continues to be staged, even though it's from neoclassical France. Um, Moliere was a gifted writer. Now, in some ways, he conformed to the... Um, tropes of his day. He was very much in the same vein as Commedia dell'arte. Uh, he was a student of it and uh, used a lot of the same kind of visible stereotypes, um, a lot of the playful shtick that we see, very slapstick, very visual comedy. But he didn't adhere to the unities. He, he often wrote in rhyming couplets, which was, um, you know, neoclassical dramatic plays wrote in rhyming couplets, uh, couplets which um, when we hear it to our modern ears, if we're not careful, can sound sort of Dr. Susie. It can sound sort of over the top. Uh, but when performed well, it's not. It's not that way. Um, 
Moliere really stood up to the Catholic priests of the day by depicting this guy in his underwear is a con artist who comes in and fools his um, the, the man of the house into thinking uh, that he is some very pious person when in fact he's super creepy and lecherous and um, manages, as I said in the video, to sort of uh, have the head of the household ban his own son, uh, you know, offer his daughter to Tartuffe and um, it's a you know an elaborate sort of the emperor has no clothes situation that um, is very powerful even to this day and as they said in the video had to be rewritten several times um, in order you know as pardoned by Louis the 14th but in order to appease the Catholics and of the time so it just once again speaks of the power of theater to change people's minds so this is, I assistant directed in grad school a play called The Country Wife, partially because I was a combatant, and as you can see there, he's holding a sword. Um, so we call it the Restoration Time because the government was shut down, not just meaning that, you know, people weren't paid, who were government workers, but that the Puritans, um, that the king was dethroned and the parliament took over and the Puritans were in charge. Now the Puritans in parliament didn't like theater and so they shut it down. So when we call it Restoration Theater, we mean that theater has been restored, that the throne has been restored and um, it was shut down 1642 and then reopened in 1660 so it wasn't a very long time um, but when Charles II got back on the throne he uh, almost instantly we have this reopening of the theaters women were allowed on stage finally in the restoration time uh, the most common form um, as seen here is w William Witcherly's the Country Wife, which was also in the video, are these comedy of manners which poke fun at social conventions of the upper class. And so it's mo mostly rich people coming to see these plays, but we're laughing at the rich people. And as he said in the video, often super body, um, you know, the country wife, um, there's a very bad word in in this you know in country and that is intentional right uh, super body humor when we get into it um, but I think hilariously funny so last but not least we have what we have talked about since the second lecture over and over again which is melodrama right melodrama I have a picture here of my beloved Cyrano de Bergerac who uh, was a hero with a large nose. You may know the same story from Roxanne, which was an 80s movie by Steve Martin. Uh, same plot, just retold for a modern age. So what do we expect from the melodramas? Um, they were in a hyperlogical time in the 19th century. We have this rediscover of the Enlightenment. We have this new emphasis on rationality, which you know, in some ways we're very thankful for today, boom in modern medicine that we think of. Um, and this well-made play is tightly constructed, cause and effect, cause and effect. And it um, is action packed. We often think of them as swashbuckling, um, you know, once again, the woman is in trouble, man hero comes to save her, good versus evil. We have at the climax what's called the obligatory scene, where we have, you know, the showdown between the good guy and the bad guy, and um, some quick and easy resolution can be accused of being uh, too easy of a resolution, right, if we're not careful. So... That has been a drive-by view. As I said, the bulk of this is told through those um, Crash Course Theater videos. So make sure that you watch all of those before you go on and take that assessment because you need to be familiar with all of it. And uh, as always, thank you for listening.